Dr. Nolan Higdon, co-author of The United States of Distraction, Media Manipulation, and Post-Truth America and What We Can Do About It, is a lecturer of history and media studies at Cal State East Bay. He's the co-founder of the Global Critical Media Literacy Project and a contributor to multiple news outlets, including Truth Out and Counterpunch, and a guest commentator for the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, and numerous television news outlets. Thank you so much for being here with us, Nolan. Thanks for having me. So let's jump right in. How has partisanship become the hallmark of American politics? There's a, a long history in the United States of uh, political partisanship. I mean, it's kind of defined the nation at some level. Um, you know, we, we have an electoral college system that basically limits us to two parties. And as the nation grows larger and at the same time, the government grows larger, uh, there's more and more concerns that are being wedged into the, these two parties. But what particularly has changed in more recently, meaning like since the 1980s, is that the political parties uh, mostly started to agree on an economic agenda. They mostly started to agree on a foreign policy agenda, but where they really, you know, tried to appeal to voters and in an effort to maintain power was largely on like cultural issues or virtue signaling appeals and things like that. And um, yeah, as you can imagine, cultural and social issues are very important to people. They're emotionally driven issues. And as a result, we stopped seeing politics a place where we could come at issues from different perspectives and perhaps compromise to where people who disagree with me are my enemy. They're assaulting me as a person. They're assaulting my culture. They're assaulting my way of life. And the media, for their part, uh, found a strategy to actually make money off of this. And this is what we talk about in um, my book with Mickey Huff, United States of Distraction, and my most recent book, The Anatomy of Fake News, that news media was consolidated in the 1980s, and corporations began to own it. And we went from about 50 corporations controlling news down to six. And um, they weren't going to make money off of journalism because journalism costs a lot of money. You have to have a lot of people in a lot of places all at once on the ground for when a story hits. Well, that means there's a lot of people, a lot of places who aren't finding stories all the time. So as a way to cut, as it save money, they cut overseas bureaus, they cut weekend bureaus, they cut small uh, market bureaus, they consolidated papers in regions. Um, they got rid of journalists on weekends. I always point out if a major event happens in a weekend in a small town, it probably won't be covered. Um, and so what do you do with all the time and space you have left, right? We still have newspapers. We still have broadcast television. We still have radio news. You basically fill it with ideological debates. And the reason why this was is profitable, um, and a lot of people have talked, this Matt Taibbi has talked about this, Eric Bischoff, who actually used to run World Championship Wrestling, has talked about this, that... Um, they took the model of pro wrestling and adopted it to news. And that is that uh, people tune into a news broadcast no longer for news, but to be confirmed in their views and to see the good guys defeat the bad guys. So if you tune into MSNBC, you're going to see Rachel Maddow stick it to the enemy Trump and the Trumpers, right? But if you turn to Fox, it's going to be Trump and his supporters sticking it to the libs. And we, we now watch the sort of this like emotional drive. But in the process, I mean, there's the eradication of um, the middle class. There's the most economic inequality the nation's ever seen. Uh, racial relations have been sent backward decades in the making at this point. Um, there's been a lot of virtue signaling about gender equity, but not a lot of policies or structural dismantling. And, but all that stuff is thrown off to the side because if you criticize um, you know, Democrats for not doing what they say they're supposed to do on those issues, you're immediately lumped into the Republican box and vice versa. And so we, we, we no longer have kind of fact-based discourse about politics. We have what um, Mark Blythe and Eric Lundgren call angrynomics, that we just are all mad and we hate the other side and we want to see it all destroyed. And that, that's not really conducive to a democracy or constructive discourse. So this sense that we have over the last 10 or 20 years that politics have become more polarized and more about anger and emotion that's actually happening. Yeah, it's happening. Uh, it's happening in real time. I mean, we have um, polling data that's quite scary. If you go back to like the 1960s, for example, parents didn't necessarily care which political party their um, child dated, right? So if your child was a Democrat, dated Republican, polls showed most people didn't care. Now upwards of like three-fourths of people do not want their children marrying someone from the opposite political party. 
um, you know, that, that's pretty scary that you have like half the nation, you know, or 40% of the nation, whatever, you're, you're completely throwing out, right? Um, but, but it's also important in, in the context of your question to remember this as well, that uh, the majority of the nation are independent and are upset with the two major political parties. And there's, you know, about this 100 million, maybe 150 million people who have just completely turned off from the system that they don't think either of these parties speak to their values. They don't necessarily hate Democrats or hate Republicans. They sort of have disdain for all of the above, right? And, that, and they're a very important group, I guess, um, <laughs> Nixon would call them the silent majority, but he would mean it very differently than I'm using it. <laughs> but um, there's this, this sort of silent majority, right, that uh, we don't really account for, but because they have no place to go, right? These are like, um, the sort of populist mentalities on the right and the populist mentalities on the left who don't see the Democrats or Republicans serving them. The title of your second book, which you co-authored with Mickey Hoff, as you said, is The United States of Distraction, Media Manipulation and Post-Truth America and What We Can Do About It. What role and how much of a role does distraction play in all of this? Uh, just, I mean, distraction plays a, a crucial role, unfortunately, in, in modern um, politics. Uh, the media tries to find something that's new and sensationalized that can again tap into like those partisan vulnerabilities and get us arguing and debating and get us hooked on the screen. But when it comes time to do the actual work of a democracy, which is make decisions, come up with policies and act, they quickly shift to another issue, um, the next sort of hottest issue. And I mean, you know, someone is someone like myself who finds climate change an issue that's dear and true to my heart. Climate change pops up and becomes important, but then it gets kicked off for like another two years and then it comes back and then it's kicked off for another two years. So there's no real movement on it. I mean, you can, you can just look at during um, the sort of last six months even, right? It was the election and then it was COVID and then it was the racial protests and then it was back to COVID and now we're back to the election. But real like, uh, real discussions about policy and the implications of these things are not in discussion. Once it gets to that point, we quickly distract away. You've identified certain vulnerabilities that enable disinformation. Can you briefly explain what those are? Hyperpartisanship is one I, I talked about um, earlier, but basically we, we live in a culture where uh, we judge the veracity of a piece of content on whether or not it agrees with our political ideology. And so, <laughs> you know, if, it, if it's, you know, if I'm a Democrat and it's an article against Joe Biden, it must be fake news, right? I don't even need to read it. Um, that, that's, that's really problematic when we sort of get to, to that point in our, our politics. Another vulnerability in our culture, I think, is sensationalism. We want to be entertained all the time about everything. We want everything to be interesting. Look, farm policy bills are really boring, but they're really important. <laughs> they're usually one of the largest bills that are passed, and they have a big influence on your life, whether you live on a farm or not. Um, so you, you can't always be entertained all the time. Some of this stuff is just crucially important, you know, and closely related. You can't really make like patriarchy and white supremacy entertaining. They're not entertaining issues, but they're really important. Um, and so they, they need to be analyzed in, in that sense. Um, clo closely related, another vulnerability I talk about is what I call this fragmented media landscape. Uh, me and Mickey Huff wrote about this. Basically, we, through our own choices and these uh, digital tools through data collection, customize our news content to give us what we think we most likely want to read or what we agree with, because the studies show that if we're confirmed, we tend to click more and stay on our screens longer. Um, and as a result, you know, if you believe, you know, Barack Obama was a Kenyan socialist sent here to destroy America, Google is more likely to give you a Google search hit that confirms that rather than the litany of sources that debunk it because it, it feeds into your bias. So that fragmented media landscape is problematic on its own. But what, what we've also found in recent research, we're working on this right now, um, is this uh, propensity to say we can't talk to the other side, like they're unreachable, we can't talk to them. That is probably like number one top of my list thing that really scares me now, uh, whether it be, um, you know, uh, sort of 
right wing like media outlets discounting certain figures. You know, you can remember like this goes back to like the war in Iraq, but you remember when they were destroyed like the Dixie Chicks CDs and canceled their concerts because they opposed the war, right? Like that kind of like cancel culture on the right, we don't talk to them. Um, similarly on the left, right, canceling like certain speakers or New York Times op eds. The reason why this is problematic, it doesn't matter if you believe these other viewpoints, that's irrelevant. You should at least understand where people are coming from to open up the opportunity that you may one day change your mind. So can you also speak to, to what extent do you think distrust in the media enables fake news, disinformation, and this kind of balkanized public space? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, and it, it's a... It's a crucial question because um, it it's explains a lot about sort of Donald Trump's rhetoric. Um, and some studies have been done recently that have shown that if you call a news outlet fake, even if you're wrong and the person knows you're wrong, it still adds a skepticism about that news outlet to news users. So regardless of how we use the, the term, correct, correct or incorrect, um, we still build a skepticism about media. But to, to, to blame the news user is to miss a larger story. A lot of our news outlets, quite frankly, have failed us continuously. And there is a distrust in media. That's why Donald Trump's fake news, if, if he had come out doing that in, say, like, I don't know, 1940, it wouldn't have worked. There was massive faith in the press and the American system. In 2016, I mean, this is after the press had sort of failed, the, failed us on the um, – outcome of the 2016 election, the coverage of the recession, um, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, of course, the legacy of Vietnam, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, these were major media failures. Um, and for good reason, pushed a lot of people to have a distrust of the, the news media. So, yeah, it's kind of a, a catch-22 when you criticize the, the media, right, that um, I'm accurately pointing out what they've done wrong and the problems they've caused. But by pointing those out, you are adding to the distrust where people have a lack of faith in media. So you might say, well, why not just stop criticizing the media? Well, if you stop criticizing the media, then people are going to have faith in a media system that's problematic and misinforming them. So there is, I do think there is a careful balance um, to, to explain the problems with media. And I think this goes back to what I was saying about lists. You can't get a one size fits all, like throw out this news outlet, watch this news outlet, throw out this one, read this one. At the individual level, that is the individual piece of content, some news is done well, some is done poorly. And if you care about democracy, you have to have a populace that's able to determine one from the other. We can't appoint these gatekeepers to determine um, what's good and what's bad. So I think healthy skepticism is good. Outright rejection of all journalism is problematic. Outright acceptance of all journalism is problematic. We need that kind of um, healthy in between, if you will. In your work, what do you think is necessary for effective and comprehensive media literacy? Like, what would you like to see in schools? Well, first of all, I'd like to see educational institutions treat media seriously, um, especially among scholars. Like, when you say you study media, they kind of don't get it. They think, you know, you're like an art student who wants to go, like, create a video or something, right? That, that's their interpretation of media. Um, so I, I'd like, you know, teach students at a young age that, like, you know, Media are our main communicators. It's how we communicate information, whether it's you know right or incorrect or whatever. And in those in those communications, they express power dynamics, power dynamics of class and gender and race and sexuality. And so, how are those power dynamics being expressed? Who decides which stories get to be told? Which stories are told? This I think uh, could sort of pull the wool back for students to ask media, right? Talk, talk back to media is what we used to say. That is, what, what are you seeing from the media? Break it down as you watch it. Um, and basically convince the American public that there's, there's no media that doesn't have a message. If you're watching or consuming or whatever, some piece of media, there is some embedded message. It could be as simple as like love always wins or something like that, right? Um, but whatever it is, try and identify that message and identify those power dynamics because they really do shape who we are. Uh, at some level, the, these recent um, uh, Black Lives Matter protests are kind of demonstrating that when there's this going back and getting rid of problematic television shows or movies and things like that. Whether or not you erase them is a different issue, but at least you call attention to the fact that like, hey, this is the stuff we grew up uh, using. And it shaped our opinions on things like race, right? We, we are we're told, especially 
especially as we live more and more racially segregated, we depend on popular culture media to inform our um, interpretations of race. And so if, you know, black characters are limited to like gangsters going to jail or poor people, um, you know, or violent criminals or something like that, that becomes your interpretation of them, um, even though there's obviously a wealth of different um, perspectives and, and lives for African Americans in this country. So I think teaching that to, to students at a young age, I think avoiding lists is key as well. Don't list good media, bad media. Give students the tools how to deconstruct media and let them decide for themselves. Um, it'll, you'll do way, way better for them in the long run. But uh, one of the you know big issues, I guess this is really insider baseball, one of the big issues, and Allison Butler has written a lot about this, is uh, teacher training programs. That is that the teachers who go into the classroom, they may be totally interested in this stuff, but they don't know where to get supplies or don't know how to teach it because it's not mandated in college, it's not mandated in K-12. And so uh, Allison Butler, I work with her, but she does a lot of independent work in teacher training. So basically, how can you add this stuff into the classroom without creating more work for the students or, or um, faculty, but kind of integrating it in place of other uh, exercises and getting the same outcomes. So I, there's, I think there's a way to do it. It's, it's a question kind of of will in that sense. And also combating back, um, you know, the, the interests of these corporations. Like Facebook, they bring out like a thousand educators every couple of weeks to teach them how to add Facebook to the classroom. I maybe give a talk to like 200 educators, maybe a year. You know, if I, on a lucky year, that's what I, I'll get to do if I get to do these trainings with like Allison or something. So um, I think combating those interests are tough. And I also know this from like speaking in our state capitals. You can go to your state capital and push for media literacy, but especially in California where I live, I mean, Facebook and Google are there all the time. I can't be there all the time. You know, I can't, and I also can't donate Facebook and Google money to their campaigns. <laughs> so, there's, so there's some big obstacles there that, that are worth uh, recognizing as well. Well, it looks like we're out of time for today. Um, if you would like to know more about Nolan Higdon's work, you can find him at, at Nolan underscore Higdon, all lowercase on Twitter. You can also listen to the podcast he co-hosts along the line at projectcensored.org slash ATL slash or at youtube.com slash along the line. Nolan, thank you so much for joining us today. This was cool. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.